Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is the fourth and final part for now in the fantastic series by Wolf in Space. As ever, please do let us know down below in the comments what you thought. Please do like and share, it really does help build the channel and our community further. And of course, don't forget to hashtag Team Fear. If you believe you have the next masterpiece that you can pen for us here at the show, please do get that over to me at the website, of course, which is www.dmtforestofear.com and go to the Submit Story or Report page. I look forward to hearing from you. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story, entitled The Beast Within The Lost Part 4 Let's get straight into that panic fear stampede if you fell no one would pick you up if you fell you were left for dead by the masses 999 calls screams growls the creature had been unleashed upon the city and now london would pay dearly armed police were on their way and they listened to charlie's report at least a bit of context piper rosenthal the girl who had popped up in London after being missing for nearly three months had been given a final night of freedom before her inevitable incarceration at the mental facility the next day. Unfortunately, this gift was part of a larger plan developed by a certain detective, Charlie Lancaster, in which she would be killed after reaching her werewolf form and Charlie would be able to further experiment on her. Charlie, at that moment, was in a heap at the foot of some stairs at the pret a -Mange, crying. A bloody, disembodied arm had been thrown across the floor, and nobody else was in the building. It had left when Piper had begun to transform. Charlie had stayed there, watching her, instead of running away while he had the chance. She had now been unleashed into London. A seven-foot-tall killing machine, and Charlie thought that Piper's first victim of the night would have run, but he was far from correct. Everybody who had witnessed Piper exit the cafe in her werewolf form was running. There must have been a couple of hundred people there, and Charlie knew that a few 999 calls were probably made. And if the officers had listened to his report, then they'd know that this was important. Armed police, probably. And talking of which, right on cue. And there were heavy footsteps before a commanding voice yelled, Armed police! And Charlie sat up. It's just me, he weakly spoke. A masked officer appeared at the entrance of the stairs. Where's everybody else? He asked. Charlie shook his head. The flea in masses. The officer handed Charlie his shoes and turned around to signal to a few more officers. Charlie pulled on his shoes and stood up. The officer escorted him outside. We have backup on the way. You can give a testimony then if you want. The officer nodded. I'm a detective, you prat. Charlie angrily retorted before shoving his badge in the officer's face. The officer backed away. Uh, my mistake, sir, he gruffly apologised. I know what has happened. Charlie, following his own strategy, quickly seized the initiative. We need to follow the crowd. Inform the backup about your movements. Check the bodies, he ordered. The squad, seven strong, left behind a police van. Two stayed behind, while Charlie led the squad commander and assumed sergeant and the other four towards the remnants of Piper's first death toll. There were a few dead bodies, around four. Surprisingly, only two were mauled, while the others seemed to have been crushed in a stampede. The officers spread out before one yelled towards the others. There's a live one here! The other officers approached this comrade with safeties off, rifles slung over their shoulders, while Charlie approached cautiously. A young man, maybe in his early twenties, had a large bloody bite mark on his leg. What are his injuries like? Charlie asked. The officer looked at the detective through their mask. Only a flesh wound, sir. Given your report, I'm amazed he came off so well. And there was a pang of excitement in her voice, almost as if it was her first time out in the field. Charlie's jaw dropped. Shit, he shouted, ran towards the hyperventilating man. He remembered to one of the interviews he'd given Danny. Bite marks. The man looked at the detective, and then at his leg. Sergeant! Charlie yelled. The sergeant appeared behind him. Yes, sir? He asked. Shoot him! Charlie abruptly said. 
The sergeant looked at him, and he raised his visor. What? He gasped. You heard me. Shoot him, Charlie responded. The whole squad looked at Charlie, including the man. Get his trousers off, Charlie asked the officer, on the ground helping the man. She did as she was asked. If he's just been bitten by a creature with a bite force strong enough to crush his skull, then where the fuck is the wound? Charlie pointed to the man's leg. The sergeant looked closely. There was no wound. Maybe blood splashed on him, he replied. His trouser is torn. This boy has been bitten by a werewolf. In a few minutes he'll be just as dangerous as Piper, Charlie argued. The sergeant backed away. I'm not shooting an innocent. Oh, you'll be happy when he tears your body into two? Charlie retorted. The sergeant shook his head. I can't. The man looked at Charlie, tears in his eyes. Unfortunately for him, the moon was right next to the detective's face. The man howled in agony, and Charlie exclaimed, Why do I have to do everything myself? He quickly yanked out the sergeant's holstered pistol, checked for ammunition, switched off the safety, took aim, and fired twice. The man went limp, two small bloody holes in his skull. The squad fell silent. And no doubt there were more of them, Charlie growled. Wait for backup, and then we'll pursue her. Backup arrived promptly. The van pulled up next to the first. Charlie talked to the commander of the fresh batch, and he was given command of the new seven and nodded to them. Oliver Hassan stepped out of the passenger side van, nodding to Charlie, and three members of the other squad followed suit, and Charlie and Oliver found themselves in charge of ten armed police officers. Get CSI down here. There are a shit ton of bodies to come. Charlie calmly spoke. He followed the screams. Euphoria. That was the one word she was feeling, as her claws fell through flesh like bread and her teeth clamped down through bone. She could claim her revenge, maybe even raise an army of monsters to follow her will. Only one bite, a gentle nick. She saw some runners enter a building, a shop. She saw the attendant lock the door and turn all the lights off. Why were they running from the joy of transformation? And she shrugged and prepared herself for a run-up. She backed up slightly before launching her 250 pound bulk at top speed into the locked reinforced glass door. Faster, faster, speed, smash. Glass was going everywhere. She could enter the shop now and she approached it. She couldn't get in. She was too big. She was growling loudly and tore the doorway out of the building's superstructure. Now there was enough room for her to get in. She heard crying. Her piercing eyes could easily see in the dark. It was not hard to find them, and she could smell their fear. She could smell the rancid sweat coming from them. There was a display cabinet in front of her, and she ripped that out of the way. No one there. Shit. She stalked her way to the till. There was a lot of light. This was a jeweler's. What a prestigious death. No, no, she wasn't going to kill these people. She was going to add them to the ranks of her army. Her army of wolf kind. The joy of transformation. She drooled slightly at the thought of the weaklings shedding their old bodies and being shown the true goodness and benefits of her condition. She was snapped back into reality by the sound of the door being frantically fiddled with. The bastards were trying to escape. She silently strode across the jewellers, dodging broken glass and items of stock. She bounded over to the till and tried to get into the storeroom. As usual, she was too big. She growled loudly in anger and tore the doorway out of the wall. She knew that the building may collapse, but decided that it was worth the risk and worth taking. She could see them, fiddling with the black door. She walked towards them and reached ahead, tearing the door handles off the wood. The group screamed. Their minds were awash with horror now. She forced a grin from her muzzle. They didn't need to worry. She wasn't going to kill them. She was just going to make them see the joy of transformation. Charlie was angry, filled with righteous fury to correct his wrongs. He was going to make Piper pay, pay for the murdering innocents and indirectly ended potentially hundreds more. His blood boiled. He broke into a run as he saw blood trails and trampled newspapers. It was eerily quiet, but in a the distance there was a screaming and police sirens. Charlie looked at the street number. Lambeth. Shit. Piper was heading 
to the city centre. He heard crying coming from a jeweller's. Safety's off. Charlie alerted the armed police. They crept towards the building, and Charlie nodded to the doorway. It had been torn from the front of the building itself. Fucking hell, he muttered. The police approached the door and walked through. Their feet crunched on the broken glass. Charlie pushed the other officers and charged through. The crying was coming from the storeroom. He backed up against the shattered doorway. Sir, get back! One of the officers grabbed Charlie's shoulder. We'll deal with it, sir. Don't worry. The officer cocked his rifle and charged in. Armed police! Stay where you are! He shouted. Charlie followed him in. Holy shit, he gasped. There were at least eight people slumped up against the back door. The youngest was probably a 14-year-old girl, while the oldest was around middle-aged. They had scratches and soft bite marks on their flesh. Charlie looked over at the officers, who began appearing in the doorway. What in God's name happened here? He yelled at the victims. A girl, maybe 16 or 17, spoke up first. She came through. She came through and attacked us, but, but not to kill us, only to attack us. Her eyes filled with tears. She had intelligence in her eyes. She knew what she was doing. She began to cry. Charlie looked at her. What did she look like? He asked. A man looked at him. She, she was big and bulky, with long black hair and black fur. She had bright yellow eyes, and, uh, oh, she had massive tits. He awkwardly averted his gaze from Charlie's eyes. She was a werewolf, the 14-year-old girl said. Charlie looked at the officers. Kill them all, he snarled. The victims looked in shock. The leading officer shoved Charlie out the way. They're injured, you prick. I'm not going to listen to you, you eating twat who can't shoot. He raised his visor. Charlie smirked. Given that I've already killed a man tonight, I'll oh, fuck off. I'm not killing a civilian. The officer shouted. Enjoyed death, Charlie calmly replied. The other officers thought back to his report. Bite marks and scratches will make them werewolves like her. I'm sure you don't want more of them. Charlie looked coldly into the officer's eyes. The man gulped. Very well, detective. The same girl looked at him. How could you? You're meant to protect us. She was cold with fear. Charlie stared into her tear-struck eyes. I would protect you if I could, but you see, that ship has sailed. Charlie left the room. Gunfire shot through the shop for a few seconds before it stopped. A thin whimper was heard before the roar of military-grade weapons continued for another few seconds. Fear. Fear was spreading across London. People were locking their doors. People were hiding. People were watching their backs. This was perfect for Piper, as it was easy to find victims, not only to add to the ranks of her army, but to give them enough food when the joy of transformation reached their virgin minds. And she was easy enough to track, and any door that was bashed in had the house promptly raided. By the time Charlie's team got to North Lambeth, approaching the river, they had already requested more ammo and fresh backup. Piper needed to reach the centre, enough victims for an army to be unleashed upon humanity. Her vengeance was unquenchable. She would make the humans who were turned against her for murder pay. Some may call her a psychopath, sure, but she was more than that. It was this that scared Charlie the most. Piper knew exactly what she was doing. She knew where she was going. She wasn't in a blind rage. He was running out of time, and she needed to be stopped before she made it towards Westminster. He radioed ahead. This is Detective Lancaster. I need armed police units on every bridge. Evacuate all bridges along the Thames. Safety's off. He received an affirmative and continued pursuing Piper. Oliver Hassan was seeing a different side to Charlie than earlier. Maybe he was so stressed with containing this outbreak that he was doing this. Oliver had lost count how many times shots had been fired, how many times he'd looked into the eyes of innocence in the wrong place at the wrong time. And before the order was given to shoot and a howl of gunfire tore their gaze into dead expressions. Oliver needed to put a stop to this. If Piper could be killed in Westminster, then that would save North London. The South was compromised at this point and armed police were on their way. But what bridge was Piper going to take? She needed to choose a bridge with enough room to bolt across. Armed police would be there, 
and she needed to have a long enough run up to cleanly rampage through. Millennium was too rickety and it wasn't in her plans to end up in attempts, especially in November. Westminster was a bit more reasonable, wide enough for her to spread her arms, long enough to build up some speed. She just had to count on the police not blocking the bridge. No, they wouldn't. Not with hundreds of civilians milling around, but maybe they would be evacuated, taken off the bridge and sent on their way. Maybe the howl of gunfire would stop her. Maybe she'd break through. Actually, of course she'd break through. She was undoubtedly the strongest thing in London. And she was running towards the bridge now. But what was this she could see? Civilians in the way? Londoners? Police were checking them for marks and scratches. She'd done that? Good for her. She knew what she'd do then. She'd raised her head to the sky and howled. It was loud, very loud. People looked over to her heavy footsteps and her bulk. People were now screaming, running, and police were falling back. People were dashing across the bridge now, and it was turning into a stampede again, and people were falling over in pure panic and fear. She ran faster, bloody teeth shining in the floodlights. The smell of gore followed her, and blood dripped from her sharp claws. Blood clotted in her thick fur. Her eyes glinted bright yellow, and staring hungrily, at the fleeing crowd. She ran faster and faster, carving her claws through the injured that had been left behind. Blood splashes across the road in the thin streams and people were screaming louder as they looked back. Police were filtering through the people at a far more hurried rate. A few of them stepped forward and crouched. They aimed their rifles. She ran faster and faster and they began firing. The heavy gunfire that would normally kill a person in seconds, but not her. Her thick skin deflected the bullets as if they crested her fur. It was making her angrier. Her bloodlust went through the roof, her claws outstretched, her jaw unhinged, wide, bearing dozens of fangs. A psychopathic grin spread across her stretched lips, and the officers stopped, firing to reload. And then she was on them. All 250 pounds of her slammed into the ranks, sending a masked officer flying and pinning another. They writhed on the ground as she impaled them with her claws, and she heard a repeated bang and a tickle on her back. She grunted before clamping her jaw down onto the officer's skull, and they stopped moving. She turned around, long black hair twirling with the force of the movement. An officer had taken her mask off and was shooting her again and again with a pistol, and there was this clink, and the gun fell silent. The officer held it up to her face and threw it across the bridge, and she began to cry. Piper spread out her arms and grabbed the officer, ripping her clean in half with a deafening rip, an ear-splitting scream that was cut short. She saw the other officers looking at her, mouths open, and she grinned again. And she bit a gigantic chunk of the dismembered officer's torso before throwing it off the edge of the bridge into the icy Thames. Charlie's team had heard via radio that Piper had reached Westminster, and they were too late. Having just reached the bridge, Charlie cursed. He ordered all the armed police units on duty to head to the bridge, and then he looked at Hassan. You're a good friend, Ollie, he said. Oliver looked at him. What? he asked, and Charlie smiled. Uh, this may be the last time we serve together, he replied. Oliver frowned. Oh, he bit his lip. Charlie nodded and looked across to the river. We still need to stop her, Ollie, he said. Oliver looked at his watch. It was only 8pm. It's going to be a long night, Charlie, he said. The squad moved cautiously across the blood-splattered bridge. A few abandoned cars lined the road, but since it was the weekend, there was less than usual. Towards the end of the bridge, a few bodies lay slumped in large pools of blood, and one of which had a pistol nearby. Officer down, Charlie! Oliver looked at the detective. Charlie clenched his fist. He yelled in anger. Did their bullets do anything? He shouted. Oliver noticed a darker blood trail. Yes, he said. The bridge was empty, and Westminster seemed to be as well. The squad moved on. Oh, this is stupid. Can't we just call a helicopter to find her? An officer said. Charlie looked at him. Shit. Go on, call one, he spluttered. Lydia Kelly sat up in her bed in Langham Hotel. 
She heard helicopters flying past her sweet windows and screams. She shrugged. She hadn't been to London much and so she didn't see this as unordinary. She switched on her TV in the bedroom. The BBC was automatically on and the anchors today seemed a bit more nervous. Lydia stared intently at the screen. The Metropolitan Police Service has issued a warning for all civilians situated in Westminster and Mayfair areas to remain indoors due to what witnesses described as a monster roaming the streets. Chief Inspector Miller has announced that this may be connected to the Piper Rosenthal case and has asked for the public to remain calm. On the ground, Bethany Snow reports. Lydia squinted at a TV screen. She unfolded the covers and crawled closer. A blonde woman with her hair tied back appeared on the screen. Armed police ran around frequently as she looked slightly nervous. Yes, after numerous 999 calls describing a monster were received by the police, they issued a warning to all residents of central London and along the Thames to remain indoors. As seen behind me, armed police have been summoned and are working around the clock to... She trowed off. Lydia frowned before her eyes widened. Police began shooting past the camera and Bethany locked herself in shock and dropped her microphone. The camera was knocked over and a horrifying scream was heard in the background. Bethany's eyes widened and her mouth dropped open before a black shape blocked the screen. Another scream before a ripping of flesh was heard and the camera cut away. This is not a drill. All residents of Mayfair and Westminster stay indoors. A booming voice came from a black screen. The screen flipped to static. Lydia bit her lip. Shit. She got out of bed and walked over to her window. Regent Street. She pulled on her jeans, a t-shirt and some shoes before grabbing her thick jacket. She picked up a keycard before leaving the suite. Mmm. Meat. Beautiful. Delicious meat. Her teeth chomped down on a rib cage as gunfire bounced off her skin. It didn't hurt. It angered her. She was ravenous. She turned on the group who were firing at her. Her appearance alone, mouth smeared with blood, some of which was dangling off her chin, and gore coating her paws and claws, and holding a decapitated head by the hair was enough to throw them off of even the toughest officer. She let them go as they ran, and she would grant them mercy. The news reporter had been ripped in half, and that was good to just reach him for the juicy organs quicker. The sweet blood rolling off her tongue, and she grinned. She wished in some ways that she didn't have the muzzle. Then she could access the red liquid much quicker. She stretched out and threw the head into the air. She hadn't seen any of her army rise yet. Shame. It didn't matter for now, though. For now, she could feast on the meat. Beautiful, delicious meat. Charlie realized that nothing was working. Gunfire bounced off Piper's thick skin. He suddenly thought to himself, Silver. He looked at the arms unit that were with him, and then thought back to his superstitious mother. She kept a box that she'd give to Charlie shortly before she died. That had been passed through the generations. She had told him to only open it when he absolutely had to. And Charlie gulped. The fate of London was resting on what was in that box. He needed it here, with him, now. In the house in South Kensington, Abigail didn't know why Charlie was taking so long, and she was dressed up to greet him when he got back home from work. Her tight lingerie was uncomfortable, and she was hoping that Charlie would come home quickly so she could get it off. And suddenly, as if it was planned, her phone began to vibrate. It was Charlie. Abigail held the phone up to her ear. Hello? she asked. Her fiancé panted on the other end. Abby, you know my mother's box set. It's in my study. Abigail looked at her hallway to Charlie's study. Yes, she replied. Charlie chuckled. <laughs> Bring it here now, please. <sighs> Abby, to Charing Cross. Take, take the tube. It's only a few stops. Charlie panted. Abigail bit her lip. But it's in Westminster. That's under a curfew. Abigail gasped. Take the tube. I'll be there to meet you. Don't worry, Charlie responded. Will you be back soon? I'm dressed up real nice and... I don't want to miss any opportunity to bring the fucking box, Abby, Charlie shouted down the line, and Abigail stopped. I'm sorry, I'm just stressed. Turn on the news and you'll see why, he hung up. Abigail sighed. She walked up to Charlie's study and found the box. It was heavy 
and had the Lancaster coat of arms carved into ornate fashion in the woodwork. Abigail huffed. She grabbed her coat and some shoes and left with a row pass and a box in each hand. Charlie wasn't waiting in a deserted station when she arrived. Abigail's heart rate began to increase as she exited the dark station. If you consult in her phone as a flashlight to get up the stairs, distant gunfire could be heard, and Abigail was getting more nervous and closer she got to the entrance. Behind the ticket booths, a few spotches of blood and footprints headed into the station. Abigail gasped. She was on the brink of losing it. She hopped over the booth and stepped into the night air. Armed police, more blood and bodies. Abigail screamed. An officer walked over to her. Get indoors, ma'am. Didn't you hear the broadcast? They yelled, slightly distorted through their visor. Abigail was now on the verge of tears. She was not ready for this. She just wanted Charlie. I've got this for Charlie. She started in fear, and the officer nodded. Give it here, then. I'll be sure to hand it to him. The officer reached for the box. No, I want to give it to him. Abigail recoiled. The officer went to grab her shoulder, and she ran out of the way and dashed across the street crying for the detective's name. Charlie heard light footsteps and sobs coming from behind him. He turned around, and it was Abigail. Oliver looked in the direction too. Abigail ran at full pelt the moment she saw Charlie, and she ran into his arms, wrapping herself tightly around him. I want to go home. I've seen too much, she cried, and Charlie sighed. I have to deal with something first, he replied calmly. Abigail looked up at him with her tear-streaked blue eyes. The mascara she was wearing had begun to run, and Charlie kissed her on the lips. It's not safe if I leave, he said, and Abigail nodded. Come on. Charlie held her hands tightly. He took the box from her and walked her back to the station. She was silent. She was shaken. She was terrified. Charlie stepped into the darkness of the station, and there was nothing there, only silence. Abigail followed him as they walked across the main hall towards the ticket booths. Charlie was about to help his girlfriend over the gates when Abigail screamed so loudly. She began panting wildly and pointed. Charlie suddenly became very aware of hot breath on his shoulder. He turned around, seeing a leering, monstrous face, black fur, snarling, gory fangs, and glaring yellow eyes. It was Piper. Charlie's eyes widened. The werewolf swung her muscly arm towards his face and bloody fangs gleaming from the streetlights outside. Abigail pulled his body back, missing Piper's claws by centimetres. They had dodged the first swing, and Piper, not expecting this, clumsily staggered onto her feet as a heavy arm grasped at the air. But it was short-lived. She was quickly back in the room, her long hair swaying with movement. She grinned as she saw Abigail's tear-streaked face. She dived at the terrified girl before a double shot knocked her from a lunge. Abigail screamed. Charlie looked up to see the werewolf picking her huge frame up off the ground and darting for the entrance. Hassan stood in a doorway to the train station, a pistol smoking in his left hand. A curfew's in place for your girlfriend too? He asked sarcastically. And Abigail embraced Charlie tightly. Her long hair was wet with sweat. Charlie could feel something warm on his arm. Tears, probably. He looked at his friend. Thanks would be enough. Oliver rolled his eyes and Charlie nodded. Thanks. He looked at Abigail and kissed her on the forehead. Oliver walked forward and squinted. What's that on her arm? He asked. Lydia walked down the stairs. The elevator was out of action and or had just been stopped manually. The building was completely silent, not a sound. All that could be heard was infrequent distant gunfire. She looked behind her cautiously. If security caught her, she'd be arrested and probably taken back to her room. She was violating a lockdown after all. Lydia made her way down the carpeted stairwell until she reached the ground floor. The front desk was manned by a well-dressed employee, and she was reading with a small light. As the lobby was pitch black, she looked up as Lydia tiptoed towards the fire exit. Miss, where do you think you're going? She asked. Lydia turned around. I'm going out for a cigarette, she replied. That wasn't entirely a lie. She had just started smoking after all. Only problem was, she was permanently strapped for cash and couldn't afford the luxury, but most of her friends in Dublin had access to the commodity. The clerk frowned. I'll have to call security. We're under a lockdown. 
Lydia rolled her eyes and continued walking. She reached the fire exit. Miss, stop moving and wait, the clerk shouted. Lydia looked at her. I've seen worse than a guard, she said, before quickly pushing down on the bar and bolting into the autumn night air. What? Charlie looked at Abigail. Her arm was bleeding. Several marks lay in her skin. Charlie looked in and pulled out a small red shard. Abigail flinched and looked at him. Charlie looked at it and wiped the blood off. It was a broken piece of tooth. He looked at Abigail. She got you, he said. Abigail's eyes widened. No, no, I'm fine. She began to cry. Oliver reloaded his pistol and Charlie looked at him. Wait, Ollie, he yelled. Oliver cocked the gun. So when it's a stranger, you give the order to fire. But when it's you getting married to one in two weeks, it's all right? He asked. Charlie looked at Abigail. Don't let him, Charlie. Please, don't let him. She whimpered. She'd only come in to give him a package, hoping that Charlie would come home and give her a good night. But no. She had just been bitten and was about to become the same as Piper. Charlie squeezed his eyes shut. Charlie, get away. Oliver yelled. Abigail wrapped her arms around Charlie so tightly he couldn't move. Oliver walked behind his friend. He grabbed Abigail's wrist. This is Charlie's doctrine, he growled. Abigail let go. Her eyes went so wide he thought they'd pop out of her head. Charlie picked himself up and Abigail collapsed. A look of betrayal was escaping across her face and Oliver raised a pistol and fired twice, filling the room up with two quick sparks. Charlie looked at Oliver. In front of me? Really? He asked. It was your fucking report that authorised this shit, Hassan retorted. And Charlie picked up the box and he opened it and there was a letter inside. To a Lancaster descendant. Of all creatures that have ever existed in this country, the werewolf is by far the most dangerous. Unknown to all by the most noble. These creatures have roamed Scotland for generations. It was only when Royal Highlanders brought the affliction with them to England. We, Lads Lancasters, saw this threat early on. We were branded as superstitious, our armories were stocked with silver, our guards were trained regularly. The threat of a potential epidemic is looming, and soon our armories will be empty. This is our secret weapon. This is the wrath of the House of Lancaster. This is the downfall of the cryptid that stalks the Empire. We have kept the secret of the werewolf secret for far too long. If this is used, then the people know. Godspeed, circa 1894. Charlie folded the letter up. He took a sheet of leather engraved with a house motto off and looked at the contents. A six-shot revolver with six silver bullets. Charlie wasted no time in loading a gun. I don't care what I said. I'm killing her. He angrily stared at Hassan and he left the station. And she was now the Queen of London. The stinging sensation of the bullet lodging in her ear had left her, and she had climbed a building, and now she was looking down on her city. Blood, bones and gore, all had been spilled to give her this title. Her army hadn't risen up yet. Shame. She was waiting for the cacophony of Howes to return to her. She let out another one for good measure. Nothing. Silence. A few helicopters crossed the night sky and she howled again to allow the fear to sink into the city. And this time, however, a call came back. It was young, fresh, inexperienced and maybe it was found. She jumped off the flat roof building and landed on a car, crushing the roof and setting off the alarm. She ran off to follow the howl. Closer now. Closer. Regent Street. It was on Regent Street. She was getting closer now, and she could smell it. Charlie mimed the howl on Regent Street, the remnants of the armed police unit sitting against the walls. They had lost morale and ammo, and were just waiting for death. It's suicide, Charlie. You're risking the life on everyone here, on the bet that she'll stop after you shoot her? Oliver, didn't you get it? Charlie looked at him. I have this. Silver, he replied. Oliver joined the officers. We'll wait, he said, and Charlie stood in a road, waiting for her, Piper, to arrive. 
and she could see the vague outline of a man in a road. Nothing much. She cut him down easily and she leered her fangs and bounded quicker and quicker. She grinned widely, thinking of the blood running down her tongue and she drooled. The figure was getting closer and closer. It was familiar though. It was. Charlie? She licked her lips. Revenge was sweet. He had something in his hand. A gun? Stupid. Bullets bounced off her. Indestructible. She was closing in. 100 meters. 75. 50. 20. Charlie raised the weapon. She saw the bullet glint in the barrel. 10 meters. She savored the taste of his flesh. Bang! And with a soft whimper, <coughs> Piper's speed was sawn in half. Charlie's shots had gone directly in her left shoulder. She looked more shocked than anything else, and she didn't think bullets could harm her. Charlie fired again, directly into her leg, and with a louder groan, she collapsed. The crunch of the bone signaled to Charlie that a shot had broken her leg. She fell face down onto the floor and skidded across the tarmac of the road. Another shot and through the right side of her body this time. It entered through her shoulder and was embedded in her lung. She gasped sharply, and Charlie emptied his barrel, releasing a hail of bullets into Piper's abdomen. He dropped the gun, standing in front of the dying beast. A click-clack of shoes could be heard from behind the detective, and he turned around. Lydia Kelly. She ran as fast as she could, and though Charlie couldn't see, Piper began to revert into a human form, and she shallowly panted as her lung began to fill with fluid. Lydia barged past Charlie, grabbing her friend and crouching down onto the ground. Her naked body glistened with blood and gore, but six deep wounds could be seen in her flesh. Piper held a bloody hand on her abdomen, and Lydia sat down and holstered the girl onto her lap. Fucking help! She yelled at the officers. They didn't move, too shocked to stand. Piper wiped her hand on Lydia's neck. You... you were... always my best friend! She weakly spoke. She breathed heavily, and her breath rattled with each movement. Lydia clutched Piper's cold hand. Same here. Same here. She smiled, and Piper began to cry. I'm... I'm... I'm sorry for... <sighs> she struggled, and Lydia hushed her. I know. She too began to cry. Piper looked into the sky. Her cold skin seemed paler than usual, her violet eyes standing out like lanterns. I... Don't... I don't want to... I don't want to go, she whimpered. It... it was Danny's fault. Get him! Convicted, please, she gasped. It seemed that near death, the lost would return to their normal state. Lydia looked into her eyes, and Piper inhaled sharply. <gasps> Goodbye, Lydia, she whispered, and she went limp and killed over into her friend's arms. Charlie looked at Piper's dead body. He didn't bother to tell Lydia Kelly to step away. The first cracks of dawn broke the horizon. He reached into his coat and produced his radio. It's Detective Lancaster. Lift the curfew. Piper's dead. And he spoke into the speaker. And there was a static before a voice came back. Understood, sir. That afternoon, Charlie stood on the roof of Scotland Yard, overlooking the city. It was windy, and his coat blew in the light breeze. He hadn't slept. He'd just given a file over to Oliver and had gone to Danny's trial. Sergeant James Clark appeared behind him. Miller's putting you on, tribunal, he said. And Charlie nodded. I know, I don't mind. As long as I get what I'm after, he said. James stood next to him. How many werewolves do you think are still out there? He asked. Charlie looked at him. A few hundred. Probably. They'll be found eventually, he replied. His eyes looked out over the buildings, and he handed James the box. This is the gun that killed her. If you want it, it's yours. James took it. He was about to leave. Listen, at your tribunal, just remember, you got the job done. You can use her as a defense. James left, leaving Charlie alone to look over the city. Wow, wow, wow. Absolutely stupendous, wonderful. 
heart racing story there thank you so so much wolf in space absolutely amazing writer i'm so proud and uh, blessed to have you on the show as one of our writers thank you so much for uh, your dedication your input and your support of course guys and girls you know the drill as ever please do let us know down below in the comments what you thought please do like and share it really really does help build the channel and our community further and of course don't forget to hashtag team fear uh, that will be it for this series for a little bit, but hopefully Wolf in Space will be uh, touching back on this one with a little twist in the near future. As ever, guys, I hope you've all had a wonderful working week and are looking forward to a relaxing weekend. But above all, remember, be safe, not sorry. <laughs>